QuickBooks Online 2023 reports for my accountant and reconciliations. Get ready to start moving on up with QuickBooks Online 2023. We're going to be using the free QuickBooks Online test drive, searching in our online search engine for QuickBooks Online test drive, selecting the option that has Intuit.com in the URL, Intuit being the owner of QuickBooks. Support accounting instruction by clicking the link below, giving you a free month membership to all of the content on our website, broken out by category, further broken out by course. Each course then organized in a logical, reasonable fashion, making it much more easy to find what you need than can be done on a YouTube page. We also include added resources such as Excel practice problems, PDF files, and more like QuickBooks backup files when applicable. So once again, click the link below for a free month membership to our website and all the content on it. We're gonna be picking the United States version of the software and verify that we're not a robot. Zooming in by holding down control up on the scroll wheel currently at the 125% zoom and noting in the cog drop down. We're in the accountant view as opposed to the business view. We will try to toggle back and forth between the two views to get a look at where things are located in each of them. Right click in the tab up top to duplicate it as we do every time because we're going to put our major financial statement reports in them. Right clicking again, duplicating again. Tab to the middle as the tab to the right thinks, going to the reports on the left and opening the balance sheet as that's thinking. Tab to the right, reports on the left. This time the profit loss, the P to the L. Closing the hamburger, the hamboogie, and changing that range in from 010122, tab 123122, tab and run it to refresh it. Back to the tab to the middle, closing the boogie. Scrolling up, changing that range in some 010122 tab, 123122 tab. Run it to refresh it. That's the setup process we do every time. Remembering that these are the two major financial statement reports. Most other reports giving us more information about one or multiple line items within it. So I'm going to go to the tab to the right and then right click on it and duplicate it so that we can open up more reports on the left hand side. And we're going to close up the hamburger and scroll down. We're going to be focusing in on these reports that are in the accountant area. Just give a little bit more detail on them. And then we'll spend a little bit more time on the reconciliation reports. Typically thinking bank reconciliation because these reports are unique in that they're a little bit different from the other reports. They're used for kind of like an internal control as opposed to being created as we do the data input and every company large and small whatever industry should be thinking about that reconciliation process because it's a huge check verification over the accuracy of your data now we're looking at the my accountant section so this would indicate that these are kind of reports that you might look at from an accountant standpoint possibly thinking then of your accountant or your cpa firm or your tax firm and that's where I would want to be thinking, uh, what's the end goal of us doing the data input, whether we're a bookkeeper or whether we're doing our own company data input for small companies. It's often tax preparation at the least, which is going to be necessary at the end of the year and financial statement preparation possibly as well. And therefore, you want to always kind of keep the, the end goal in mind and possibly have the tax preparation firm, the accountant in the loop. So as you're doing the data input, you're going to have that end goal and make the, the year end process as painless as you can. Now, obviously, at this, these days, we can provide more information to an accountant using QuickBooks by adding them uh, as the accountant so that they can get access to the data. So these are the reports that you might imagine that they would want to run. You could actually run these reports. I mean, if you were in an, another accounting system or oftentimes you still might just say, hey, look, I'm just going to give my accountant what they need. Balance sheet, income statement, trial balance, and so on in order to do the job I'm asking them to do like tax preparation. But if you have QuickBooks, it's likely that you might give them access to the software by adding them as an accountant. So just a quick look on how to do that. I'm going to hit the, the hamburger and we're going to go down to the uh, accounting down or my accountant down below. 
And there, of course, uh, an accountant be can be your best partner. And so you can invite an accountant, possibly giving them access, allowing them to look through the through the reports that they need. So then we can imagine these as the reports that possibly the accountant might be picking up. So now let's say, well, why would these be accountant type of reports? Oftentimes, it's because these reports are going to be using kind of debit and credit type of reports and giving more detail. Okay, given that, one, we've got the, the general ledger. So if I right click on that and open that in another window, we've got the GL report. Now, if you've taken accounting classes in a, a school environment, l learning accounting from the, the books, from a book or something like that, 010122, 123122 tab, and then run this, then the general ledger is thought of as, is going to be the detail report. Now, if you look at it here, you're saying, hey, look, this looks like the transaction detail report. So if you work from the bookkeeping's perspective, you're going to say, hey, look, I've seen this report. That's the report whenever I go into a balance sheet, for example, and I go into the checking account, I drill down on it, I get a transaction detail report, which is giving us the information by date of transaction and all this other neat stuff along with it, as well as the increases and decreases to the count account that from an accounting perspective if you, if you learned it in a classroom this report this would basically be a general ledger report for cash the account of cash uh, so you can also run the entire general ledger which would be all of the accounts so if i collapse these you could see all of the accounts right for the general ledger so before we had access to software oftentimes the accountant, if they were going to do financial statements or an audit or even possibly taxes, might want the entire general ledger in this format so they can get the detail supporting what's on the balance sheet. Might be less relevant these days given the fact that you can go into the actual balance sheet if you have access to the software and drill down on it that way. So it's similar information. So there's the general ledger, the GL. So I'm going to close that back out. And then we've got the journal report. We might spend a little bit more time on the journal report later, but if I open this up and check it out, close in this, I'm gonna go from 010122 to 123122 and run it. Notice that this report gives you, uh, gives you all the information in a journal entry format. So quite nice report. If you wanna basically see what has been done over a certain period, and you can also try to look at the debits and credits by by looking at each of the forms that were entered and then trying to see what the actual journal entry is, not just from an increase and decrease perspective, but from a debit and credit perspective. You might also use this form for billing purposes to try to count the number of journal entries and try to say, I'm gonna bill based on uh, the number of journal entries. This is a great report for, for reviewing as a supervisor for example to see what other people have done because you could say what have they done in terms of data input over this time frame you can see the types of transactions that they're using it's also a type of useful report to sort by transaction type because you have all these different types of transactions and you can focus in on say invoices and whatnot and see what the standard journal entries are for say an invoice so I'm going to go back up. Now, the reason it might be an accountant report here is because it has a debit and credit column. So anything with a debit and credit column is probably put in this category by QuickBooks because QuickBooks is going to try to make the data input as easy as possible without debits and credits. You got the profit and loss. These are redundant reports. We saw them up top. Of course, the accountant would want them if you're going to do the taxes. That would be the baseline, your P&L report. Uh, if they didn't have access to the software, but they're already up top. Recent uh, automatic transactions. So you can see the uh, the things that have been turned on for automatic transactions to re be reoccurrent. Uh, recent transactions. So this is this is nice report to see the, the, the ones that have been up recently. I'm going to come back to the bank reconciliation. We've got uh, the recurring uh, template list. We got the statement of cash flows. This again is a redundant report because it's one of the major financial statement reports or at least second to only the balance sheet and the income statement constructed from, as we discussed earlier, the balance sheet and the income statement. You got the transaction detailed uh, by account, right clicking on this, open it up. So now you've got uh, the transaction information by account. Let's go from 010122, 123122 and run it 
So now you've got your accounts to, is you know similar to the chart of account information because it's breaking it out. I'm sorry, the general ledger information because it's breaking it out by account and giving you transactions by account. However, you might want a, like a transaction detail report by date. And so we'll talk about this one in more detail later, but I'm gonna close this back out. That's this one, transaction list by date. We'll dive into it in more detail later, but just to take a quick look at it now, from 010122 to 123122. So now you're not looking at a GL because it's not breaking it out by account, but rather by date. So you can see the time frames that things have been put into place. It's kind of like that journal report, except that you don't have the debits and credits. It's trying to put everything on one line. So it is condensing the transactions. So you can see a nice quicker, uh, shorter list of activities. Also a great report possibly to base your billing on you might try to say how many transactions I've entered into the system and bill based on the number of uh, transactions. Also a great report to sort by, by transaction type to look at activity for a particular transaction. Closing this back out, the other one is the trans is uh, you got the transaction li list with splits. This is a neat report as well because it gives you that same data but it also gives you the splits. So, so 010122, 123122. We might talk about this one more in the future as well. So it's a similar report, but now it gives you the multiple line items that are impacted. So it's like the GL report, but it's not in the format of debits and credits. Uh, it's, it's more in like an increase decrease format, but it lists all the accounts that are impacted with the forms. So that also could be a great report to focus your billing on and try to get an idea of which accounts are affected by transaction. Also a great report to trans to sort by transaction type. We'll talk more about those most likely in a future presentation. And then you've got your trial balance, which we might talk about more in a future presentation too, which is in essence, your balance sheet on top of your income statement. This I think is, is here because it has debits and credits, but even if you're not used to debits and credits, if you can get a feel for where the balance sheet accounts and income statement accounts are, this is a great report to open instead of the balance sheet and income statement as you're doing data input, because then you can do the data input with the plus button here. And as you're entering these transactions, you can jump over to this report trial balance instead of the balance sheet and the income statement, drill down on these accounts and you have only one report open instead of two, and it's much more streamlined because you don't have all the subtotals in it. So we'll talk more about it later. Now let's get to the bank reconciliations. Now these ones, they don't have an actual reconciliation in here. So I just want it because it's, a, because it's one of those verification type of reports. So we just wanna get an idea of what the bank reconciliation is and why it's a little bit different. We're gonna go into it a whole section in and of itself on uh, the bank reconciliations and we'll actually do mock bank reconciliations in a future section or course so uh, we can focus in on it but the idea of the reconciliation if i go back to the to the balance sheet is that clearly the checking account is here and we can also ask ourselves well as of 12 31 22 uh, do i really have 1201 that's the question most people think of with the bank reconciliation and we can go to the bank and possibly a bank statement, let's say, looks like this. This isn't, this is for a, a different, not having the same company data in it, but this is a mock bank statement. And let's say that the balance was different. This is different dates, but let's say that amount, the balance was different as of the same date, if it were the same date. Uh, that would be common in a full service accounting system to have the money in our books as of 12 31 22 to be different than what's on the checking account side of things. So we might say, well, then I've got to, I've got to fix this basically to, to, to make sure that it's right. That's one thing that we're trying to do with the bank reconciliation, but that's not the only thing we're trying to do. It's not just the fact that cash is so important that we've got to, we just want to verify that that one number is correct because what we're really trying to do is, is use the cash account due to the fact that it's being involved with all other flows in our system and the double entry accounting system to verify that all the transactions in the checking account is correct. So it's not just, so in other words, you might say, 
hey, look, if this amount was 1,201 and my checking account was like 1,000 and I'm only $201 off, who cares, all right? It's not as immaterial compared to my, to my overall dollar amount. I'm not gonna waste my time worrying about it. But you're not really worrying just about the $201 in that case. You're, you're trying to reconcile so that you're verifying every transaction within the system. And if I go into this account, if I can verify that all of these transactions that happen in the checking account are correct, then I'm getting a verification on all the other cycles. See, this bill, for example, is not only affecting cash, it's a pay bill, it's affecting accounts payable. This, this is a payment, it's gonna be affecting the customer cycle. This is an expense. So the other side's probably gonna to go to the, the income statement of, of uh, an expense account. So I'm double checking the expense account. A check form, the other side's probably going to an expense account over here. The sales tax, the other side's going to taxes. So because the cash is the lifeblood of the company, it has an impact on every other cycle in a way that no other account does. Cash is involved no matter what kind of cycle you have for the vendor cycle, whether you have a cash-based, accrual-based, cash is involved in there somewhere. Cash is involved somewhere on the customer cycle at the end of the cycle, whatever that cycle is, cash, accrual, depending on the bank feeds, we expect the deposits to be going up typically. And obviously it's involved in the employee cycle. So our goal with the bank reconciliation is to verify all of the activity in the checking account. And due to the double entry accounting system, that means that all the other accounts that are impact, impacted by those transactions are also verified. So it's a much bigger thing than most people kind of, you think at first glance, ah, well, the checking account's close. What, you know, that's fine. So, and so notice that small companies, large companies, everybody should probably do the bank, should do the bank reconciliation because uh, if I was to look at this, for example, at someone's books and say, okay, how much trust do I have that these books are accurate, that they put the data input accurately. The fact that you're using QuickBooks is a huge step up in and of itself. Why? Because you have the double entry accounting system. You have assets equal liabilities plus equity. QuickBooks forces you to do that. That double entry accounting system is an internal control, the biggest one in and of itself. However, it's quite possible that you just don't enter some transactions and or you you enter them uh, incorrectly or you know if you if you if you still have the double entry accounting system the the reconciliation of the checking account verifies it to an external bank and that gives you that added level so if someone is both using quickbooks and doing bank reconciliations my level of confidence is way higher than if they weren't doing either one of those two things and it doesn't have to be quickbooks any kind of accounting software and doing bank reconciliations they're using a double entry accounting system and doing the bank reconciliations then the level of confidence uh, goes way up now other thing just to note on the bank recs which we'll talk about when we get to the reconciliation process is that now you've got this issue of bank feeds happening and you might say well if i have bank feeds how does the bank reconciliation work within bank feeds and just give a, a quick look at that uh, and and let's jump on over to to our chart of accounts over here and you could if i think about this like on the customer side of things then notice at the end of the day you expect to have a deposit for goods and services that you're selling typically and like we've talked about in the past there's different ways you're going to structure this based on your industry the easiest way to do that would be that you're just deposit you're waiting till something clears the bank and depositing it then possibly with gig work if you at youtube is paying you or you're getting paid by google or amazon and you just wait till they pay you and you record it as a deposit if you do that you're in essence using a deposit form and you can use the bank feeds and that kind of system in that kind of system you're not only on a cash based system you're basically waiting till it cl clears the bank you're dependent on the bank so now you're constructing your books from the bank there's nothing wrong with that if you have a system that can do that but, but it's not really a full service accounting system because you're not entering the data separate from the bank and using the bank to verify, you're just entering your data from the bank. In that case, if you can do that, then, then great. Uh, that would mean that your checking account would match pretty much all the time to what's on the bank statement at any given point because you constructed your data from 
the data from the bank. You didn't double check your data from the data from the bank. But if you have a if you have a, a system where you can't do that, like you're at a cash register, for example, then you're gonna get the cash. You're still on the cash-based system, but you're gonna get the cash or the checks and or the credit card payments, and then you're gonna deposit them. In that case, uh, when you when you make the deposit, it might not exactly match the date that it clears the bank. You're gonna end up with differences in timing because when I made the deposit on my side is different than when the bank made the deposit. That's when in a full service accounting system, we have this difference that's gonna be natural. It's gonna be there all the time. It's getting smaller and smaller these days because, because the transactions clear much faster. But even, you know, even if I deposited the money today, it still takes like a day to clear. So I might have a difference between what's on my books from the banks and I'm verifying that. I can verify that with the help of bank feeds but the bank feeds are now just double checking the data input, like a bank reconciliation. It's helping me with the bank reconciliation as opposed to uh, me using the bank deposits to create my books. So there's, there's a difference there. And then if it's, it's a full accrual system, I have to enter an invoice and bill the client, which doesn't have any cash involved in it at all. That's when I record the revenue, then I receive the payment, and then I record the deposit. Now you could, you could like fit the bank feeds in here. Like you might say, well, I'm gonna have an invoice and then try to use the bank feed to connect to the invoice. But oftentimes we would think this would go through the whole process. I'd make the deposit and then I would have to tie it out to the bank feed. So once again, the bank feed is a double check. We're doing our books. The bank is doing our books on their side in the cash at least. And we're double checking as an external third party verification of our books. On the, on the vendor side of things, many times these days, people do electronic transfers. So it's more likely that small companies can uh, do, do their books from the bank feeds, meaning again, you're reliant on the bank, but because there's because the transfers are happening pretty quickly, then th that works pretty well. However, uh, if you're writing checks, that's when you're, you're definitely gonna have this difference. You're gonna wanna enter the checks when you write the checks so that you can see when they're cleared and which are outstanding and you're going to end up with this difference on outstanding items so we'll dive more into the the bank reconciliation process in the future it's, but just note it's, it's different because the bank reconciliation process isn't something that you're doing as you do the data input when i do this data input from all these forms invoices sales receipts i'm not actually creating a bank reconciliation i'm just doing my books on the double entry accounting system and then, and then the bank reconciliation is me taking my books and comparing it to a bank statement from the bank. And then, and then looking what the differences are. And if there's a difference on the bank side of things that's not on our books, then it's most likely the bank is correct and we're gonna have to fix it. We're gonna have to add it to our books. If there's something on our books that's not on the bank statement, it could be just that that's an outstanding item. It's a deposit that hasn't yet cleared because the bank hasn't processed it yet, or it's a payment that hasn't yet cleared because the bank hasn't processed it yet. If we constructed our books directly from the bank with the bank feeds, instead of verifying to the bank with the bank feeds or reconciliation, then we should tie out exactly because we made our books from the bank instead of verifying our books uh, to the bank. So that's the general idea. We'll dive more into the bank reconciliations later, but uh, it's, it's, it's a really important internal control to do whether you have bank feeds on or not. If you're constructing your books from the bank feeds, it'll be a really easy thing to do, right? Because it'll tie out uh, exactly, but you still want to have that double check. So if I go down to the accounting down here, you can go to the reconciliations and and here's you know your your reconciliation kind of process so you could get started with a reconciliation i'm going to close this out and the ending balance would be whatever the ending balance is a thousand as of 1231 let's say boom and then you go into your bank reconciliation now this is the reconciling process this isn't an actual reconciliation report and once you once you reconcile this then it'll generate uh, a bank reconciliation report. Now also just note that you can also do the bank reconciliations for the credit cards as well. 
Uh, let's go back over here and reports and balance sheet. So the credit cards are also a financial institution. You, you remember they act similar to the bank account and you can do a reconciliation. But m most of the time, people with credit cards are entering their credit card data, at least the payments of the credit card with uh, the bank feeds if they're connected to the bank. So the credit cards should tie out quite easy. You still want to do the reconciliation, but it should tie out. You shouldn't have any outstanding items if you're entering the data into the system directly from the credit card bank feed uh, system. So it should, again, it should be a pretty easy process, even though that's not like a full accounting process, because again, normally you would enter the data and then verify to the credit card statement. But because the timing is so short and we're becoming more reliant and it's more dependable that the transactions are correct, we can take the data directly from the credit cards. Okay, let's go back to the first tab and just go to the drop down and go to the switch to the business view just to see where stuff is located in it as opposed to the accountant view. So we had the business overview reports. That's where our reports are at. And then we also went into the, where did we go? We went to the bank reconciliations, which are under bookkeeping right here, bookkeeping, and then the reconcile item down below. So that's where that reconciliation uh, is. I think those are the main areas that we went in this one. So there's where they're located under the business view.